public reporting, a D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser first called Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy to ask for help at 1.34 p.m. It looks now like the Capitol, the, the police... Yeah, now, Pete, let me break away from you a left. second because things are happening very quickly. According to your written testimony, you were, quote, aware that demonstrators had breached the Capitol. Welcome to Democracy Under Fire, a show that examines the causes of the collapse of democracy in America and around the globe, and asked what we must do to save democracy. We will be organizing and working to build a movement in America capable of saving democracy. We are the Truth and Democracy Coalition. Make sure to sub subscribe to my YouTube channel and to like the Truth and Democracy page on Facebook and spread the word. That is how we're going to build a movement. To support the show and the Truth and Democracy Coalition as we work together to build a movement to save democracy, make a donation at GoFundMe and search for Democracy Under Fire. Today, we have with us Rolando Cano, candidate for mayor of the city of Whittier, California. First, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Rich Procida. I've been fighting against Trump's attack on democracy since the Miller Report came out. And I've been defending the Constitution for even longer. I've been organizing, writing, speaking at rallies, holding Zoom meetings, producing podcasts, meeting with my representatives, and organizing to save democracy. Our democracy is under attack by propagandists, both foreign and domestic. Right now, democracy is collapsing all over the world. If we want to keep our democracy, we are going to have to fight for it. We need a democracy movement in America capable of bringing tens of thousands of people into the streets. So I decided that I wasn't going to wait around for others to do it. I would build a pro-democracy movement myself. To that end, to that end, I formed the Truth and Democracy Coalition. For most of history, people have lived under the rule of tyrants. Humanity's central political struggle is between authoritarian forms of government and democratic forms of government. Democracy will not survive unless we organize and fight for it. I decided to give it my latter years to this cause because I will not let democracy die without a fight. So, I want to give Rolando the opportunity to tell us what democracy means to you and why it's so important to fight for democracy, especially now at this moment in history both locally, nationally, 
a global name. But first, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, Rolando? Well, th first of all, thank you, Rich. <clears throat> My name is Rolando Cano. Uh, I've run for Whittier Mayor uh, twice before. This is my third time. I originate from East Los Angeles, um, and I moved here in 1993 uh, into the city of Whittier. Uh, my family has always followed uh, politics closely. Um, I, upon moving here to Whittier, uh, took part in uh, going to the city council meetings and really just absorbing what the city was about. Um, everything was new to me. I grew up in an industrial area where, um, you know, you were surrounded by gangs and uh, really um, you called, you didn't really call police. You know, there was a lot of, uh, um, a lot of emotional um, results from the 70s that led into where, where I was growing up where uh, at 11 I would be assaulted um, by officers or by gang members. So I really had to find my own path. Um, upon coming to Whittier, I did, uh, I saw something different. I saw the possibility of growth. Um, Whittier literally saved my life. Um, I, at the age of 16, wandered into Uptown and was able to see firsthand a community that actually functioned properly. You know, I was approached by police my first time in Uptown, but um, they approached me and they just asked me, how, you know, how are you doing? You know, what's going on? Do you need any help? And, you know, a kid comes from East L.A. started getting all defensive. And I was like, well, what am I doing? Why are you stopping me? And this officer, um, Scoggins, who is still on the force, he um, he was on bike patrol. He just said, well, you look um, like you were confused or like something was going on. So we just wanted to make sure you're fine. And then they left me alone, which was shocking to me. I continued walking down uptown. And when I saw a reflection of myself, I realized why I had been stopped. And it wasn't. Um, because I was being singled out. It's because I chose to single myself out by looking around and keeping an eye out because I came from an area where if you saw car lights, you know, headlights turned off, you knew it was a drive-by. If you saw any gang members coming and the moment they caught eye with you, you knew something was going to go down. So I was always on high alert. Um, here, I, I realized that I had an option to breathe you know, to really just take the time to learn on who I was and what I was really after. Um, upon um, attending these meetings, I got to meet a lot of local, um, a, lot, a lot of locals that were involved in government. Um, we had Mr. Ted Snyder, who was a big um, inspiration to me politically and, and just on what was right. Uh, one of the biggest accomplishments I ever had here in Whittier was um, to initiate the beginnings of my political career, uh, which were based on uh, truth. You know, when someone gives you their word, you know, you should trust that um, the ability to create a functioning system within Whittier, uh, because Whittier is within a 15 mile radius, anything is actually possible here. Uh, we can make it easier for people to get out and vote without making it an obstacle. Uh, we can make every school successful because, again, we're within a 15-mile radius. There's so much we can do for the community, and our government here leads us to believe that somehow we're the minority, we're the ones that really don't fit in, and that somehow Whittier is conservative, which you get in many other cities and, and states. But not... I mean, COVID has its positives, I, I guess, uh, to a certain degree. Um, obviously, we've lost a lot of people, but one of the things that we've been able to do is get to know ourselves. We were forced to stay indoors, and with this upheaval around the world um, and in the United States of, of Black Lives Matter and different action taken by minorities standing together, um, people woke up and realized that we are not the minority. We are the majority. And one of the biggest outcomes that we're seeing now is people that are gatekeepers, people that are at the cusp of their career, um, some of them, you know, um, elderly to the point where maybe they will not be around for the next five years, but they're all fighting hard to suppress any kind of change. And the people have understood that the power is locally. You know, you, you have your presidents, you have your governments, you have your 
assembly members, you know, statesmen, but they all make their living off of local politics, local people. You know, the mom and pop shop produces more um, profit for the senator, for, for, for mayors, for even the president to take any kind of action when they give us something back. We're like, oh, well, you know what? They're taking that money out of my pocket without us understanding that from the very bottom, they've already taken it. We're just trying to figure out what we can do now to preserve it and do something positive with it instead of allowing the people higher up to continue to make these changes that affect us, that go against ourselves. So once we, we you know, um, I understood that early on and I've been pushing uh, the same message that you've been pushing, but slightly different. I, I like to focus on what happens locally. Um, the the voter rights that are being violated locally, the, the small things that are being done intentionally to limit us um, on speaking out or in favor of something or against something. Um, but the overall outcome is if we want to hold on to our voting rights, if we want to fight for what's right, we start in our home. We start locally. Because whatever our local elected officials do affects the top. And if everyone at the bottom says enough is enough, the top can't function. So we really, really need to stand up and, and make ourselves aware uh, as to the true definition of what voter, voter suppression means. I mean, being convinced that your vote doesn't matter, that what's the point of going out when you have long lines? And they're successful at it at the local level. When you have the state coming at you in the same way, I mean, there's millions upon millions of dollars that are being used to convince you of the same fact. So we have to become aware of what's happening locally and translate that into the bigger picture. Yeah, kind of like when they are at the border, they wanted people to remember self-deport. Remember that? Yeah. Just make it so unbearable. This is institutional state violence, right? Not necessarily with guns, but using the power of the state to make people very uncomfortable and even cause them pain and misery. Yeah. And so self-deport. So here's what they do with democracy. Let's make it so difficult. Let's make it painful for people to vote. It makes it less likely for people to vote so that they can have more control, more power. So we have like changing the date of an election to an off-cycle election so that there's a lower voter turnout as they did in Whittier and specifically doing it for that case, for that reason. Correct. That's a form of voter suppression. I mean, you're looking for a less voters. You're looking for your voters and a, make it harder for people. That's what the recall election is about. Right? You, can, you don't need as many signatures to get a recall. You get the recall, you got another sh shot at trying to overturn the will of the broader public, which have voted the candidate in the office. And Governor Newsom hasn't done anything wrong. Correct. There's no reason to remove him from power, but because there's a procedure that one can use to try and push somebody out of power, but you're abusing that process when you're doing that because it's not meant to be used just to try and get another bite at the apple just to try and get power it's only supposed to be used when the governor has done something or a candidate or a political office holder has done something that he deserves a recall and there's no nothing here to Correct. deserve that of course and, and you know the, the the biggest problem with that is you know we we have so many people that are organizing to um, remove Newsom, yet you have um, local elected officials like mayors with every city that, you know, um, they create a dangerous game. They, they are deciding to be in favor of this recall, and it seems like some of these people, they don't even take into account um, their political party. You, have, you now have Republicans and Democrats working to remove Newsom, but they themselves are not taking any kind of leadership position to do something better within their own capacity in their own town. So they, they are using the people as a tool, as a pawn to remove, uh, um, you know, to remove the governor 
but when you really look at brass tacks, you realize that it, it's a, a power grab. I mean, this whole movement uh, is is being created with deals that are being made because there is a progressive movement. It's called awareness. And the bottom line is the people that are currently fighting against us and pushing for that recall, they're afraid of our awareness. They're afraid of even answering the most basic questions. You go to a city council meeting here in Whittier, you're not even allowed to come indoors. You know, you're supposed to be called upon to ask a question where no one's taking notes. Even here in Whittier where you have districts, it's not a true uh, uh, system. You know, they people look into gerrymandering, but here you have districts where elected officials have all decided together to vote in pulling funds that were automatically separated to support these districts into one uh, um, general purse, therefore removing the intention of, of and the purpose of forming a district. You have all these actions that are occurring, and when it translates into something negative, they point the finger at our governor. Now, the governor has done everything possible, um, and, and there's probably more. There's always going to be objection that there's more that can be done, but he's been doing everything possible to support the majority, and the majority I mean the people that are struggling, not the people that are waiting at home for their delivery to get there, or that are arguing that someone's job is more essential because they need to be able to go buy uh, their items at a, at a particular store, or, or they feel privileged to go in and sit down and have a meal, where the rest of us are just trying to figure out how to get the next, you know, uh, the next income coming in to be able to buy a handful of items that you know, you go to a grocery store and continuously starts, you know, you have inflation moving up and we're still going through a pandemic. But they point the finger at our governor when they themselves have refused to do anything whatsoever other than work against their own people. So we really need to remember awareness is their enemy. If we become aware of how things function locally, then we are able to see what they're doing at a larger level because at the bottom line is their power comes from the people that are here locally. Whatever we decide, whatever we become aware of, and whatever we change we create at the bottom trickles up to the top. It's not the other way. We've been led to believe, you know what, trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics only works for the person at the top. And another explanation for trickle-down economics is the pyramid scheme. The person at the top will always make more money than the people at the bottom. Unless we become aware and realize the people at the top need the people at the bottom to make the changes that they claim are only specific to them and the privilege only lies in their hands, it does not. It, it actually is a responsibility for the people to become aware, even at the most minute level, which is, when can I go out and vote? Can I send my ballot out? They've made it so simple so that we just have to fill out a form and send it out. But they've created so much conflict that... Even people with the most common sense are like, well, what if my vote doesn't get here? What if it doesn't register? We have the ability to follow through and figure out if our ballot made it. But we're so bombarded with all these ads on recalling the governor or, or suppressing the vote one way or another. And we're starting to believe it because we, we have both parties working against us. Not everyone. We have people that are fighting, that are standing out and risking their positions to bring awareness to the people, knowing that they have nothing left if all this passes. They're risking it all. They're not leaving anything behind. The rest of these other people that are funding um, this drive to recall the governor and to create all these other changes that would make it more difficult for us to, to voice our opinion through our ballot, they are so efficient that, I mean, we, we really are, are falling for the most basic scam that we never would. If someone calls you over the phone and tells you, give me your information, you'll be like, there's no way I'm going to give you my information. But if someone says, you know what, don't even bother, we'll take care of it, that's when you become troubled, when you're like, wait a minute, what do you mean you're going to decide for me? Like, you're going to decide what I'm getting, how I'm getting it, and even if I'm part of, of this decision process? But the thing is, unless we become aware of that, we just keep stumbling upon, looking at our phones, seeing the next news flash from either Trump, Biden, or any other person. But it really comes down to us understanding what happens locally and how that affects the top. But this recall is a sham. So we're 
Yeah, if we resist, if we resist, we will win. Because their power comes from us, allowing it. Now, a lot of people have resisted and lost their lives, so we need to recognize and honor those who have lost their lives fighting for democracy. And so, I wanted to ask you, Rolando, why is democracy important? What's about this time in its moment in history? Is it, is it important? Why is it democracy important to you and the right to vote important? Look, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of examples right now, but I, I want to believe that if you use what's happening now, if you really focus on, on not blame, but just the issues, what, what you're seeing, um, we've seen what's happening in Afghanistan. You know, we have so many sites coming um, towards a decision that our president has made without the realization that it was a long process. There are a lot of people that took part in this. And at the end, you know, everyone's casting blame at how this is ending. But when you look at it on the other side, being, uh, being from Afghanistan, and you see this, this light shining for the last 20 years, you have families that maybe at one point were highly restrictive in, in having kids because you're thinking... If I have a daughter, that's a danger to my child. And regardless of whatever system exists, that's a parent thinking about their child. Within these 20 years of different presidents, different leadership, both parties, we've inspired this other entity to believe that change can be created, that their voice matters. The outcome towards the end, what we're currently seeing is that fear that we should be feeling when the people that are there see that light fading away. Sorry. <clears throat> you see children that are screaming, that are saying, save us. It's literal and it's also symbolic. You have families that are doing the same, that are tossing these kids over uh, a wall and it's not the first time we've seen that. We've seen it in Mexico. We've seen it in many different countries. You have these people that are seeing that light dim and that they know that the moment this new entity, this, this oppressive government comes in, little to no hope will be left for their children, especially their daughters. Here in the United States, we need to understand that it is so critical to to learn and understand that this can happen to us. Imagine that that happens here in the United States. We would be the ones tossing our kids over to Mexico, to Canada, sending them on boats back to Cuba if that kind of government took over here. That is democracy, that is inspiration. When we realize that other governments are going through it, and they've been going through it, 70s, 80s, when Reagan was president, we saw the terrorist attacks that were happening against our people, but we stood our ground. We're at the point where we can no longer just stand by and, and see things as not as big of a deal. Because of COVID-19, we see that the government shut down. We're able to restructure anything now because we're coming from a loss. Once things get back to normal, there is no going backwards because it would not be cost effective and it comes down to money. But the bottom line is that here we have a unique opportunity to, to speak up and say what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Cuba, what's happening in, in Salvador, in, in Mexico. And we ask ourselves, why does everyone want to come in? Why do they want to take what we have? It's because it matters. When we reach a point where we're tossing our kids over the border in the opposite direction, it's too late. We see many political um, activists, not from the past, but now that are children. Half of them, we don't even know their name. They speak once or twice, but they're carrying that message to try to create change. We need to remember that there is still a population um, that experienced what was and what is 
and we should remember why we fought hard to be the United States that we were, we were once. Even now, that light that's fading away in Afghanistan for the hope of democracy, of having the ability to speak up and defend your own. You know, that's us. That light that's dimming is our light that's dimming in their eyes. So we have to realize that this voter suppression that's occurring, whether it be minute or major, that is our light that continues to extinguish here within the United States. And unless we realize the sacrifice that people have made, all these kids that have died on the streets. Where I grew up, I lost a large majority of my friends. By the time I was 16, I was stabbed on three different occasions. Shot at, never a gang member. Beat up by officers, beat up by you know, gang members, fighting back. I fought tooth and nail to get to where I'm at today, which is believing that there's something better. If we don't fight for what we know and what we believe is better, regardless of what side you're on, there'll be nothing left. And we will eventually see ourselves putting our kids over the, the border on the opposite end. We need to fight for our rights because they're, they're using our money. People will say, well, you know what? I don't want to pay for that. We're taking care of them, this and that, the liberals, the Republicans. I mean, it goes back and forth. But in the end, we're fighting for something that's already been taken away. The thing is that the people that are, that are pulling the strings, they're fighting for the right to just use the money any way that they want, pointing fingers on things that don't even exist. I mean, the boogeyman, great. You know, you should be afraid of the boogeyman. But until we know what that is, it's, it's just a fable. It's, it's a story they tell us. We have to understand our position and we have to realize that light that's extinguishing in Afghanistan for those people is our light. And we have to keep it burning bright here so that we can go back and inspire the rest of the world. We have to keep the beacon of democracy lit in America, not only for the sake of Americans and our democracy and our way of life and our freedoms and our civil and human rights, but for the sake of democracy around the world. Because we have not been a friend to democracy, the United States, even though we've People want to say, oh, we've tried to help democ promote democracy around the world. Truth is, no, we've been an enemy to democracy in many parts of the country. So it's not true that we've tried in any right. significant way to establish democracies. And now Afghanistan is a huge failure, huge failure. Uh, but so was Egypt. We lost Egypt. Correct. Right. And so was the Arab Spring. And so one of the things that I've been looking at as the causes of this is the widespread dissemination of disinformation, not just by national sources, but by international sources. And so we get all this, these boogeyman you're talking about, and they want to divide us. And so and it's happening all coming down from the top and it's not just from the media I mean there's a lot of sources from it so people are being set against each other American against American and we need to see past that we need to see that that fellow Americans no matter their race or religion they are fellow Americans and we need to treat them as such and even foreigners you know, the Bible says, welcome the foreigner. Treat the stranger, the, your neighbor, as yourself. And, okay. and so this is what we need to do, of course. And so do you have any idea, or do you have an idea of what has led to this moment? What is causing this collapse of democracy? I have an idea because I think it's the basic fundamental struggle of humanity. We've had tyrants for most of human history. We're trying to develop a system that can respond to the will of the people, and the tyrants don't want it. Correct. You know what? I, I've seen a lot of changes occur in the last 10 years. Um, maybe that's related to um, my initial involvement in local politics, but it is very critical to understand what's behind that, that sheet 
you know, we hear uh, Wizard of Oz when Dorothy pulls that sheet and sees the truth. When we start peeling away at, at, the, at this layer and you start seeing the truth, you understand that we don't have geniuses running government. I mean, some of them are highly qualified, but there's a large majority that are businessmen. And the businessman does what they do best, create business. Now, one of the things that we've seen since the 90s is that business translate, that model translate into a corporate one, where the corporate model no longer sees faces, they see numbers. You know, the original models saw the face and said, this individual holds value. This individual holds value. And you're valued for being an individual what you bring into the, this, this model. When you have this corporate model and numbers only matter, results equal in both uh, success, but they also continue going with failure because the corporate model's failure adds additional funding. We see that in education. We see that in government. If you have one city that's struggling or one side of the city that's struggling, Traditionally, you flood it with a lot of funding to try to create this balance. But with the corporate model, that's just another access to funding. You go in there and you no longer create a program that's successful. You create a conversation. You have that when it comes to the homeless situation. You have that when it comes to many political decisions. You have that when it comes to education. They see failure as additional funds. And when those funds that are creating this failure within this conversation start going down, then you create this other access to pull money from the people and flood it with additional conversations about the original conversation. So in the end, you have no reason to succeed because failure is success. You see that everywhere. You see it in elections. You have some people that, like yourself that are creating this movement that are getting the, the knowledge out there and using the original model. Each individual holds value. That means something again, especially with COVID, but these people with this antiquated model see it as, you know what, instead of bringing more people and using them as a valuable asset, for myself to get reelected, I'd rather shut it all down and get the people that I understand the least to come out and vote because I already have that system set up. So my results don't even matter. Failure or a lack of, of uh, local interest or, or interest overall for the population to come out and, and vote is not a factor in a lot of these um, uh, movements in a lot of these elections and a lot of these changes so what's the easiest way to ensure that the person that sees value in the individual is controlled well they'll control access to your ability to speak up because the moment you hold value to each individual you become a dangerous entity you now have 10 10 people strong that will always be there then that'll grow to 20 that'll grow to 100 that grows to a thousand and as long as you're holding value in these people and these people are translating the same message, then we all become valuable. When you have a, a, a politician or a person that's a gatekeeper that's fighting against our ability to uh, just take part in the election process, to be able to go in and vote, they make it difficult. They ensure that even if you have 100 people lined up, as long as you keep them there, you devalue their importance. And once the elections are over, if the outcome is in favor of the person that invested to remove your rights, they become stronger and you become convinced that you don't matter because they prove to you through their model, I produce success through failure. You're no longer valuable. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the changes that have occurred. Right now we're at a cusp where because of COVID, you have people like yourself, like myself and others that are speaking up saying, no, your model is broken. It's led to nothing. We spend billions on no result whatsoever other than a continuous conversation.
that's led us to where they've led us. And these people that are now standing up and speaking up that hold value, they're trying to shut us down. It could be as simple as them creating the ability to create the election, make it a national holiday. Mm-hmm. You know, the 5th of July, why not? Right, right. You know, it's Cinco de Mayo, hey, let's go get drinks afterwards. Whatever you want to do, align it with something else. Right. You create that, you have a larger turnout. But is that the intention? Of course not. You see it locally. Mm-hmm. You have uh, our, our Whittier Mayor Vinatieri and four, uh, three other members of the council that you have uh, Kathy Warner, um, uh, Fernando Dutra, you have um, Martinez, who all voted in favor to change the date, knowing that the cost is, is really minute when you see the outcome. You have about 50, 60 percent turnout when aligned to a national election and when you revert it back to a June election you have it in the teens you have maybe yeah. 20% I mean that that is an intention uh, of our local government and you see that at a higher level but in the end that's the corporate model failure works for them the rest of us are now speaking up saying we demand more than failure we're tired of this failure we demand to go back to what Reagan once said you know, made in the U.S. Why not? You know, people ask me, who are your political heroes? John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Why? Because they created enough change, good and bad, that we woke up and started fighting and benefiting uh, out of the outcomes. We're at the end where all that benefit is gone. We have new leadership and no direction. We have too many people playing this game that failure is success, and that has to change. But thanks to people like you, Rich, we're not accepting failure. We're saying we want to go back to the original model where every individual has a value. Right. And you know, finally, we're going to need to fight, right? We're going to need to build a movement to save democracy. That's, we're going to need to be able to reach out to the middle of the country. And that's part of what this show is about, is to be able to reach out to fellow Americans, we cannot rely on any other, anybody else or any other group to defend democracy, defend the Constitution, stand up for the American way of life, um, freedoms, unless we can't depend on other people to do that for us. And we're going to need to stop allowing our government to overthrow democracies or undermine democracies, even allying with dictators. I mean, I know they're between a rock and a hard place, Mm -hmm. but we need to actually encourage democracy and rather than corporate interest, our profits, or our interest even, period, we should seek the common good. Correct. Now, just so, what do you think we need to do to save democracy in America. You know what? I Look, entertainment distractions have created every change, every advance, advancement from technology to programming to even the show. The ability to do something from your own home, from any position that you're at. Um, I, I really believe that the way to fix this is what we've kind of already begun, which is regaining our family values, going back out to participating in the community. Um, my wife and I, we do a lot of volunteer work, but it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be that. Walking to your local park, interacting with people, you know, um, removing that fear that someone is different from you, therefore you should fear them. We should remember that that difference is what leads us to something better. When you come out and you communicate to someone, you might be going through a difficult time. You might be saying, I'm struggling. I I can't think. You know, this is all overwhelming. You go outside to a more public setting like a park. You have the kids playing. And you start thinking, you know what? This is nice. You know, you might see a homeless person or someone doing drugs. And you're like, I don't like that. But then you meet someone else and they're like, oh, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. That's not right. And then you just start that communication. 
that communication is key in aligning ourselves with people, not even like-minded, because there, there will always be a difference. But create that link, understanding that that difference is okay. You know, with these, these past few years of elections, we've been in doctrine to believe that any change that's minute is, is obviously someone that's an enemy to you. Doesn't matter what they think or say, even if, if, if you have the same belief, if there's some difference, we're led to believe that right there, you should become suspect of that person. We, we are literally in doctrine into believing that the boogeyman is right outside our door. And to some degree, he is. But we can't just assume that everyone we see is the boogeyman. We have to assume that there are people that are like us that are going to engage us and just have a basic conversation, a reintroduction to your neighbor. You do something like that, create a movement and say, let's reintroduce ourselves. You go to a nice area, you know, people have worked hard, but an area that doesn't struggle with the uh, uh, basic struggles that everyone else does. People that are well off, you know, have the super yacht, have all that. What do they have? Community. They'll go to a country club where they interact, they're eating together, they're playing together, they're speaking together. They've been doing it. It's been working for them. We used to do this. We have rotary clubs. We have all these clubs that have created programs for the community, for our kids. Wherever your kids are, the adults go. We all share something. When we share the same experience, we fight for the same thing. What we need to do is reintroduce ourselves. Create a movement where you get to know your neighbor again. Then create a movement where you go out and get to introduce yourselves to the business owners. It doesn't matter if they're from India, from Afghanistan, from Mexico, from Russia, from wherever they are. That's a person that's moving forward trying to do something in their community. And when you build that relationship, you always get that, how are you doing, Rich? Hey, good to see you, Rich. I mean, look at Cheers, where everybody knows your name. We create that kind of environment. And it would be difficult for someone to come get in your and say, look at them, they're different. You better be careful. They're after your money. That person, they must be illegal. That person, they must be working off of the system. You know what? Whether that be true or not, if it's not affecting my life, if I'm able to move forward and they create value to my life, to my community, why not? What does that matter to me? What should matter to me more is what's happening around me how we can reintroduce ourselves, how we can get to know each other. Because once you create these links, these bonds, I'll be damned if anyone's going to come and tell you, hey, Rolando, man, that guy is a piece of work, this and that. Because Rich, you'd be like, well, I talked to him and he didn't seem to come across like that. What, what are you talking about? Then you start having these conversations. And as long as I'm the kind of person that says, hey, bring him in, let's just have a conversation. And we have that conversation. We clear any doubt. And we're able to move forward. So we also have that responsibility when we introduce ourselves to someone new to be able to handle any kind of opposition because we should have that conversation. Why are we opposing each other? You know, one person told me, oh, you know what? We got to be against the NRA. And then I met another gentleman who was uh, in the South who is an NRA member uh, you know, leader of this gun club, and he was talking to me, oh, you know, I walked into this bar, and he was like, you know what, y'all, you're from California, you must be one of those liberals. He's like, you probably don't even own a gun, and I'm like, of course I do. He was like, well, you're not an NRA member. I'm like, of, of course I am. And he's like, what? And he's like, but are you against controlling, uh, documenting homes, guns, and, and tracing people? I mean, our government's worked against us, and I tell him, well, look, what do you think about creating an insurance company? You know, just not run by a government, but let's insure our guns because I would hate if someone steals my gun or it breaks and I can't replace it. And he was just quiet thinking about it like, hmm. And I'm like, NRA could have their own insurance company. You guys log everything in, someone gets damaged or lost, you replace it. He's like, that's a good idea. I'm like, it is, right? He's like, you know what? I'll look into that. That's a good idea. He left happy, I left happy. But what's the end result? It's gun control. Yeah. To a certain extent. It's how you look at things. It's how you speak to people. When someone comes into your door and you don't know them, you don't know what you're going to expect. But you at least open that door. You're having this conversation. 
So we need to be ready to meet these people. And we also have to be accepting of any differences. But in the end, it's reaching out and getting to know each other again. Because there's no way in hell that someone that you've never seen that's an assembly member, that's a, polit a politician, that's higher up, that doesn't even bother coming into our area. There's no way you're going to believe them or the people you live around as long as you get out there and get to know them. Right now we don't have that and we need to work on that because we are losing um, our ability to differentiate between a friend and an enemy. And we really need to realign that. Right. I, I think some of the things that we, this propaganda has put us with extremists, right? Like the person you meet, all of a sudden they think because you're liberal or from California that you have all these extremist points of view. Yeah. And so we're in a battle amongst the extremists. And yeah. most people are not that. You know, I remember Cheers, and I never liked Cheers because it was just insulting. Right. Just insulting people. But it brings me to the point of, you know, we have a problem with narcissism and people not growing, being grown up. So, um, and we need to truly learn to listen to one another. Not just think, oh, what am I going to say next? Well, how am I going to respond? What's my counter argument going to be? I mean, I do that too. But what we need to is stop and truly listen to what the other person is saying and not jump to conclusions about what they're saying just because they may say one thing that triggers us, and that's really what this is about. We're being triggered. They're pushing our buttons. They're doing it to raise money. They're doing it to gain power. They're doing it to win elections. But it's pushing our buttons, and we need to be more discerning about the information that we consume. I agree with you, Rich. I agree with you 100%. Thank you, Rolano. So, vote no on the recall. The, this expensive and unnecessary election is an abuse of the recall process. It's a power grab by mega thugs and COVID deniers. Also, go to represent.us. They can help you call or meet with your senators to tell them to pass the For the People Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, the DC Admissions Act, and tell them that the filibuster must not be allowed to stand in the way of democracy, nor should it be allowed to block the other party's agenda or to frustrate the will of the people. In a choice between democracy and the filibuster, democracy must prevail. Defending our constitutional democracy is more important than the filibuster, which is not constitutionally mandated. The filibuster as portrayed by the iconic Jimmy Stewart in the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was about a man standing alone on principle. It was not about political obstruction like it is now. The Republicans are using the filibuster to overthrow our democracy. They intend to cause people to lose faith in democracy and in the Democratic Party's ability to address their concerns. Thank you for watching Democracy Under Fire. We will be airing weekly on Facebook and YouTube. So like the Truth and Democracy Coalition on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube page, Rich Proceda. Tell your friends and groups and organizations about us and to join the Truth and Democracy Coalition. That's how we're going to build a movement and to support the Truth and Democracy Coalition and this show. Go to GoFundMe and search for democracy under fire. Thank you.